Okay, good evening. Welcome. Um, Sports Therapy Association, let's talk about episode 17. It's two past eight, so here we are, live. Um, I must remember that not everybody watches it live, so if you are listening to the, the recording, um, or what, rather watching it on YouTube, um, then that's great. Thanks for supporting us, and make sure you hit that subscribe button. Um, if you do want to join us live, uh, then this goes out every Tuesday um, at eight o'clock on the Sports Therapy Association Facebook page, which is just facebook.com forward slash Sports Therapy Association. So there we go. People are already flocking in by their hundreds to say hello. Remember, if you do want to say hi, um, then uh, we can bring you up here. Emma Victoria Wardle is saying hi, guys. Hi, Emma. Thanks for joining us. Hope you're really well. Um, Sharon Headley is in. Hey, Sharon, how are you? Apologies again that you won't be tasting my mum's cakes this year, but hey, maybe next year. We live in hope. Um, Becky is here as well. So as always, um, we've got a great subject and I'm so excited about it. It's something which is so true to us all, um, affects us all, particularly if we've gone back to work or we're teaching. Hey, Namir, how are you doing? Um, and Mark. So, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to as much involvement as possible from you guys. Um, but to help us, uh, then we are going to have uh, the pleasure of um, some input from two of our um, industry's legends who will be coming up as well as Gary will be in the house as well. Um, before I do all this, let's get rid of that. Um, let's me remember to say uh, thank you to Tom last week. Uh, Tom Colwell was in um, talking about marketing your significance, not your services. And there really were some gems in that. Uh, there was some good feedback I was reading on Facebook. Uh, Tom is getting heavily into uh, mentorship and he's really putting out some really useful stuff out there. Some really interesting ideas about how to market yourself, what to sell um, uh, is the selling one session and then wondering why your business is maybe suffering something we need to change. Um, Tom's well into this idea of selling um, like a month or something now, getting a commitment from the client, having time to have a relationship with them. So that's on YouTube as always. All our episodes are on YouTube, um, Sports Therapy Association. Um, if you do go in, please, please, please just hit the subscribe button. You won't get any spam or anything. It's just really so that it looks like we've got loads of subscribers, which is really nice if someone else from the outside visits. Um, before we bring up our guest for tonight, I also want to say thank you to this lady who you might recognize um, from um, the artwork. I was scouting around trying to find why I need an image of somebody hopefully wearing a shield um, or face visor and a mask and some gloves and maybe putting a thumb up or something. And there's me going through Facebook. And of course, I find the one and only Hayley McKendrick from Durham. So quick Facebook message. Hayley, do you mind if I just take your picture to put on a, um, on Facebook? And and she was fine about it. So that was great. I interrupted her during the school run. So Hayley, if you're listening or watching the recording, then thank you very much for that fantastic photo, because uh, it sums up exactly what we are talking about tonight. Look at that. That's a massage therapist or sports therapist. How did it get to this? So to help me talk about this uh, tonight, let me just uh, put that picture down. Then um, we have got um, Gary, who's going to start off with some housekeeping as well. Um, so STA members, um, this will be important for you. Um, let's bring Gary up. Boom, boom, boom. We've also got um, Matt Scarsbrook, who's going to join us. Let's bring up Matt. Happy Christmas, Matt, by the way. Nice to see you in uh, Lapland. Let's hope things are going well there. 14 weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> Beer's looking good there, mate. You've had a trim recently, haven't you? It's looking I good. Have, I yeah, I've got yeah. for you. Well, it looks like the Brighton Beer Company are doing their stuff well, so they're looking very well groomed. And we've also got Mike Grice, who's returning after a wicked um, anatomy uh, session we had uh, uh, early on in one of the early episodes. Mike, how are you doing? Thanks for joining us. I'm good, thanks, Matt. Yeah, good to see you again. Um, it's great to have you all back. Um, I'm going to stick some names up. Um, if you don't know these people, um, well, hopefully you know Gary, but then I'll take that for granted because we are getting more and more people coming in who aren't STA members. Um, and I do appreciate STA members actually sharing this with their friends because the idea is we are getting people to to come along, see what we're all about, see how wonderful we are, see how supportive we are as a group and to and maybe join us because the bigger we get, the more impact we can have uh, the, and the better we, more tools we'll have to change the industry. So, um, Gary, over to you, mate, for some housekeeping. What's new? Yeah, hey, uh, evening, gentlemen. Uh, it's just a few things I, I wanted to bring up, really, for the benefit of, of the admin team and for myself and the members. Um, we've just had a really heavy renewal period. There's a lot of memberships were extended during COVID, um, and, and we... We decided um, to increase prices of membership. Um, it would allow us to do more things, uh, basically. 
Now, I have written uh, by email uh, three times to every member as a way of a reminder. Um, we ha Jake has been uh, using the STA Gary Facebook account to send messages. We've sent text messages, left voicemails, and still people don't want to speak to us. So we're getting a little bit concerned. Um, so what I wanted to say was, if you are watching this, you are an STA member and you have a PayPal subscription, which is for £48, please cancel it. Um, if you go to the STA website, go to the About drop-down menu and About Renewals, you will, there's a set of instructions on how to do that. It will vary from, from device to device. Um, you had until the 30th of August to renew at the old price. Unfortunately, now all the renewals are being processed at the new price of £60 and not £48. So if you've got a PayPal recurring subscription, please cancel it. Get in touch with uh, Jake or myself, admin at the sta.co.uk. Um, it highlights um, a communication problems. So I'm just going to ask those who are in the house tonight, um, you know, the members out there, how do you want us to communicate with you? You know, MailChimp and Constant Contact has a bounce rate of about 35% for Hotmail, Gmail, BT Internet, Yahoo, AOL. Um, we try to communicate through social media platforms. We try to communicate by text to your registered number. We try and leave you voicemails. Um, but some people we just don't get a response from. And, and that's great if you don't need us. Uh, that, that's great. So, you know, I don't mind you ring me up every day or once a year. Um, I'm here to help. What I would say is that those of you who are still using my personal Facebook profile for getting in touch with STA um, uh, issues, if you like, can you please send a friend request to STA Gary, um, because that's monitored by the admin team as well. So you will get a, a, an instant response. When I'm not in the office, uh, I, what I'm tending to do now is, is leave my phone, because uh, every week my uh, app will tell me that I'm on my phone for about six hours a day, um, and, and I think that's too much. So <laughs> I'm cutting that down. So when I'm doing my other work, uh, I just leave my phone. Um, I, I don't talk to, you know, my family or, or anybody. Um, so the STA Gary account on Facebook is monitored. Um, just another one on communications. Uh, I think we picked the wrong time to to, to try and launch a committee um, because it was about the time we were all going back to work and 27 of the STA members very kindly offered to support the STA committee. So I sent everybody an email and, and I will now apologize to the six people who have responded to me. Uh, I had intended to send out a, uh, you know, a comprehensive document of what was uh, the ideas that had come in for discussion and for consultation. Um, I, I'm still waiting. So if you are at all interested in, in helping the STA move to the next level, we still do need committee members. Those of you who made um, you know, promises before to get involved, please revisit that. If you want me to resend the email, please get in touch with me. Um, and then finally, uh, regional representatives. I see quite a few of them in, in, in the chat tonight. Um, we're trying to get two regional representatives in each area. So it's a sort of a workload split. And then on Friday evening, Scott Loins, who's the coordinator, he's up in the northeast. He's hosting a, um, a chat with, with a lot of the regional representatives who can attend. Uh, and we just want some ideas from you, really. We want some uh, some fresh ideas, some fresh impetus about what the regional reps can do, um, how you can uh, involve your local networks. Uh, and we've opened it up uh, um, initially to non-STA members can join a regional group for a probationary period of three months. Uh, if at the end of that three months they decide not to join, then they will be removed from the group because it forms part of the member benefits. But um, on the website in the about section, regional reps, we have now got everybody's details up there. Regional reps who are here tonight, please check your details are correct. Email me if anything's gone awry. And we are going to do, we're still working in the background on a regional map, which will show your contact details and your location so that any members who are from your area will be able to get in touch with you directly to ask to be added to the group. But it also gives the opportunity for non-members to, to contact you as well. So please ensure that your contact details are correct. I will put a link in the, in the regional representatives group in due course when we get it, all the teething problems ironed out.
Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to tonight's chat. There's been uh, quite a lot of social media content over the past few days since the last announcement last week. So it'll be interesting to get some um, some feedback from the, the guys who are working in clinical practice. Um, obviously, I'm not at the moment. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll hand over it back to you, Matt, and uh, we'll start this discussion. Cool. So there we go. Um, yes, yeah, so some important information on there. Um, obviously, if you haven't got any questions, and it's always the same, it's uh, Gary at thesta.co.uk. Um, uh, yeah, and and you can always use the comments as well. If you need any links or anything put in there, then do use the comments as much as you want. So before we just crack on, let's just have a little quick look through here. Um, I'm just going to flick through here so you can get your PPL hell today in this heat. Yeah, tell me about it. It has been very hot, which is something we can talk about later on. It's all very well saying we need to wear this, this, and this, or for people to tell us we have to wear this, this, and this. But I'll make it about 30 minutes through before I'm dripping on the visor like something out of a car wash. It's ridiculous. So it's, I don't know, we'll be talking about that. Maybe there's some tips. Um, it is tonight going to be all about sharing ideas. If there's requirements, we will label them requirements. We might realize that it's more recommendations. Um, but, but there might be some opinions and some helpful tips with regards to how to make life a bit easier, particularly people who are actually practicing in a clinic. So do please feel free to share. There might be some eye openers in terms of, you know what, you need this to give you insurance. Um, there might be some debate going on. So as all, well, I don't have to tell you guys, but keep it. The first reaction a lot of the times when someone tells you you're doing your job wrong is anger. So we'll keep it obviously respectful, but there could be a few little uh, interesting debates going on. Um, but feel free to share your opinion. Um, don't hold out at all if, you, if you're annoyed or something. Just voice it. And there's probably someone else in the room with the same opinion anyway. I'm um, just going to say hello to as well. There's a lot of people here waiting for the conversation to start. Adam Tonks, how are you doing? Um, you're an employee of the NHS. So that's interesting to hear that perspective as well and what's going in there. Haley's in the room. Chris Kitson's in the room. Scott's in the room. Great. Lovely to see you guys all here. Glenn, how are you doing? Big Keith is in here as well. There's apparently... Therapy's loss is going to be rugby's game. Apparently he's getting back into the game, I saw. Um, he's slimmed down a bit. It's going to be scrum half now, but it should still have a great game. Um, Sammy Jack is coming up with a question. Oh, what does regional representatives involve? I think rather than answering that now, Sammy, just send an email. Or is there a link somewhere on the website, Gary, which explains? Uh, yeah, is that to Jamie? That's to Sammy Jack. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I've emailed Sammy. Uh, well, I've sent her a message saying just send me a... Uh, an email I've, I've put a typo actually in my own email address which is quite embarrassing <laughs> uh, so yeah and then just to, to answer jamie if you go on to the sta website jamie um go to the about drop down list find renewals and the information is is there about how you cancel paypal oh, there you uh, go. Cool. and my email address is gary at the sta.co.uk brilliant right well, people are still flooding in okay well PPE. Um, where should we start the conversation? I would start saying, okay, can someone just tell me what the uh, requirements are, please? But it's not really that simple, is it? <laughs> can we start with goggles? Okay, yeah, let's go on. Yeah. Goggles, what's the deal? Well, over the weekend, um, after the announcement last week, you know, the rule of six announcement, um, the government website was updated to say that certain professions and we were linked as sports and massage therapies in that advice and guidance was that um, polycarbonate goggles of a safety type could be used instead of a, a, a visor in certain circumstances. Um, I can't find what the circum certain circumstances are. Um, but when I've spoken to people from other professions, the, and I'll use the hairdressers as an example, and this was given to me by a, a friend the other day. Um, if a hairdresser is carrying out a technical cut, they complain that they couldn't see safely, um, you know, to carry out that cut with a steamy visor. And the beauticians have said that if they were applying makeup or, you know, certain procedures, um, they couldn't see as well. So dispensation was put out to, to those groups to wear goggles. Um, you know, I can't find, you know, I've asked for clarification from the insurance company underwriters and I've asked for clarification from the lead body for, um, for soft tissue therapies. As yet, I haven't had anything. So the recommendation is, is still to wear a visor. Um, however, I'm I'm open to be swayed by uh, public opinion and, and from the guys who work in clinical practice to give their experience. 
I haven't tried goggles yet. I just want to say one thing because I haven't tried goggles. But what is the, um, excuse me if it's obvious, what's the advantage of a goggles over a visor? For us as therapists, why are people going to say, oh, yeah, give me goggles. I can't stand visors. What would be the advantage be? Visors tend to steam up a little bit quicker, I suspect okay. would be it. And and also, to be fair, for for some of the hands-on work, if the visor has to extend below the chin and wrap around the face, there's just some sort of awkward occasions where you kind of catch the edge of your visor while you're moving around. It's not a showstopper by any means. Um, it's just a bit irritating. <laughs> um, so if, if goggles really are... Uh, appropriate um then it would be beneficial adam's just put it adam tonks has just put in there that for information purposes they have to be en166 i think that is without my glasses to be used for aer aerosol generated protection um so that's a useful bit thanks for that adam uh, um you know that with with the visors you know, uh, although it's it's always been a recommendation, and, and the guidance for our industry was belt and braces, gold standard guidance from the word go. And ironically, the the regulated professions have now been brought into line with ours. And and we were talking earlier about we expected a relaxation of the visor, not for the the other professions to be brought in line with us. Um, you know, I can't see a point of wearing a visor unless you are face to face. If your client is laid on the couch with a face in the breathing hole, what what potential benefit is there from wearing a visor in that circumstance? I can appreciate when you're doing a consultation and you might be doing something close to close, uh, uh, sort of face to face, close proximity with your client. And I can understand it then. But, but to wear it all of the time um, and go through, you know, people were saying it's in this weather, it's it's unbearable. I think it's, um, it's probably it's probably worth mentioning and correct me if i'm wrong but my understanding certainly from um insurers such as balens is that um you are insured so long as you're following the recommendations of your uh chosen professional association so for people who are thinking of changing to goggles now that it's out on the government website that may be a little bit too swift if there hasn't been updates from the professional associations at uh, the moment, you have to follow the professional association guidance to ensure you're actually insured, um, which does mean there's going to be a little bit of a delay. Whilst, as, as Gary mentioned, um, we seek some further clarification to make sure that it is, in fact, appropriate for us and we can make those recommendations. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there aren't any professional associations who have given the specific go ahead for goggles yet. Um, yeah, that, that's correct. And I, one of uh, our regional reps had put something, a link to the government uh, guidance. Uh, and I said, you know, just, just hold fast for a, for a second, you know, let the professional association do their thing. That's what we're here for. We're here to support you and work in your best interests. So let us do the, the, the work in the background. Let us chase uh, information from the appropriate uh, authorities. And then we will, at the right time, give you that information and, and and it is a recommendation you know even though we we do issue these recommendations in guidance form i know that some members are not wearing visors i know some members are not wearing gloves you know that will be a, a matter for the individual to take up with the insurance company and the track and trace um which which brings on to an, another subject about the app that's coming out ne next week and we've, we've had an update from some of our members frank seeger in scotland is very good at providing me with information about how that's working and and at the moment, um, and, and Matt will probably reinforce what he said earlier after this, um, if you download the app, now it works on monitoring Bluetooth signals and proximity to other Bluetooth devices. And in Scotland, if you are in proximity to another Bluetooth device, um, for more than 15 minutes, the app will actually log it as a close contact now if you have your phone on your desk at the office and you're in a shared workspace and somebody on the other side of the wall has got their phone even though there's no direct contact you will still be um identified as having that close contact because of the, the proximity of your bluetooth devices so the recommendation is that you turn off your bluetooth which kind of defeats the object of what you know what we're supposed to be doing um, matt you had an interesting point earlier didn't you um about uh, the track and trace uh yeah so 
Uh, and I probably should mention, so for clarity, I'm sort of also wearing a hat um, for the ISRM this evening. So sometimes when I refer to we, I mean the ISRM, uh, governing body for soft tissue therapists. The uh, professional governing body, where did that come from? Dirty <laughs> word. Professional association, let's get it right. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the ISRM um, sought some... Uh, guidance from Public Health England uh, a little while ago. I mean, uh, for anyone who's dealt with Public Health England uh, at the moment, the turnaround time for response is several weeks at best. Um, but, but a little while ago, we sought some advice on levels of PPE uh, for essentially soft tissue therapists, sports therapists, um, you know, us, us lot who are, who are no longer massage parlors, um, about how what we were wearing would affect the uh, the the requirement to isolate should we be contacted by track and trace and in the response that we got from from public health england in writing um it was fairly clear that it kind of doesn't matter um the wording they used was unless you are a trained health professional wearing ppe and trained in wearing that ppe um, it doesn't really matter what level of PPE you are wearing, you will be told to self-isolate if you are counted as a close contact. Um, now, that information has been somewhat muddied. I think the water's been somewhat muddied by some other feedback that we've had. Um, but uh, some feedback on one of the uh, Facebook forums, one of the support groups, uh, a physio was writing that his sports therapist was contacted and was basically told they needed to isolate until they got a negative test and it didn't really matter what they were wearing. Um, so it has a, it has happened at least once um, that, that we know of. Uh, so it suggests that we should be wearing the protective equipment that the professional associations recommend because it covers us from an insurance perspective, but there is at the moment, a strong likelihood that even if you were wearing everything recommended and more, the test and trace uh, teams would still ask you to isolate as a close contact. Mike, go on, jump in there, yeah. mate. So maybe I saw you on the Facebook post when I put some stuff out. You came up pretty quick with, it's my understanding that if you're wearing this, blah, 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 then you haven't got to self-isolate. So, Yep, that, that's been the guidance from... Um from GEOSC, uh, General Osteopathic Council, and from the CSP. Um, I think it's a bit more than PPE though as well. I think it's not just wearing apron, gloves, visor, mask. I think it's all the procedural element that goes with it as well. So making sure that you're screening clients before they come in, um, and then all of your risk assessments are done. Um, and it's all of those steps as well as the PPE. And um, I think also, it because uh, I've heard similar uh, feedback to Matt, I've heard um, some um, some uh, kind of lead uh, test and traces have said, if you're if you're doing all that, then you, you won't be asked to self isolate. Um, but then I've also heard, like, like Matt said, that um, some people have been as well. So I think um, I don't think there is a clear answer for sports therapy. I think it's clear for because uh, it's it, it's on the CSP website, um, and I copied uh, copied that the other day. Um, it said if you are wearing full PPE, then you won't be asked to self isolate. Um, it's clear, it's clear, it's clear as a bell. But I suppose um, that's so because the CSP are representing registered healthcare providers. Yeah, it, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely get that. Yeah, and um, and yeah, and same for GIOSC as well. You know, but we uh, as part of our standards, we have to uh, we have to adhere to the PHE guidelines for close contact uh, services um, or um, healthcare. I think it. Uh, I can't remember the exact wording, um, but um, yeah. So we have to we have to wear exactly the same. So um, we we have all four. Um, I've said to my guys that work in my clinic because we've got sports therapists as well that um, you may be asked to self isolate, but if we go belt and braces, then the likelihood is reduced um you you know you may still have to but um we're doing everything we can to to stop it yeah i think that's a really important point and it reiterates what what matt was saying as practitioners we have to follow the guidance and the recommendations of our professional association be who that may you know and if that's if we're doing that like mike says we we're reducing the likelihood 
and that's all we can do at this time. Let the associations mm -hmm. argue the point with the authorities that our members are wearing chemical warfare suits, want a better description, and, and as such, shouldn't be uh, asked to isolate. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, follow the recommendations of your professional association. It ensures that you are insured to practice, and it makes our job easier, I suppose, in the fact that we've got a, a consensus of, of, of opinion from all of our members that they're adhering to our policies and procedures, and therefore, you know, we can fight your battle. If you choose not to wear gloves, masks, visors, you know, I can't fight your battle for you, I'm afraid. So, Gary, one question for you, and I'm not I'm not familiar with what it says on the website, but are you? Do you think instead of rather than using words like guidelines and recommendations, if there's a risk of you not being insured and potentially, or well, not quite sure about the self isolation, but even the insurance one, should these words really be requirements then? Or is that tricky to actually put that it's on? It's a very difficult one. You know, if it was left to me, it would be a requirement. But, you know, the STA are a membership association. We offer membership support and advice as well as other member benefits. We are not in any way a regulator. So you can choose to join or not to join. You can choose to renew or not to renew. We, we can't mm -hmm. force you. And therefore, as a membership association, we can only give our best advice and guidance. Um, it would be a lot easier if it was a requirement and everybody had to do it, but it, it just isn't. I, I've said the same as Gary in my clinic. I said, because um, uh, I've got personal trainers as well who are wearing full PPE. I've, I've, I've said it's a requirement of my clinic. If you want to work in here, it's not a part of your, um, well, there isn't really a regulatory body for, for fitness professionals either. Um, so I've used best um, best practice and said right this is what we're doing in the clinic if you don't want to do it then then that's up to you but you can't you can't book sessions in here if, if you're not doing it because we've got um, potentially vulnerable patients coming through on the gym floor and we need to make sure that they're protected so and that's that's quite an interesting one I think from um, certainly from a multidisciplinary clinic perspective um, because you know if you take uh, a standalone self-employed working by themselves sports therapist, then the procedures that are in place in terms of all of the screening um, and then um, and then obviously screening again on the on the day of the appointment and then uh, taking them through and they're wearing a, uh, a mask, you're wearing a mask, you've got all the hand washing, you've done your risks. All of that is obviously designed to reduce the risk of an infection coming into the clinic to a well, to, to such a level that is practical, basically, but it's all about reducing risk. Um, and as soon as you've got sort of multidisciplinary where, and I think this is probably one of the reasons why the registered health professionals have more requirements on them in terms of what PPE they wear, and it, it's only seeming, seemingly getting tighter with the CSP's latest uh, update for, for visors for physios, is that by definition, they are likely to be seeing more vulnerable patients. Whereas as a sports therapist, the only vulnerability really you ought to be seeing is that they are they have an injury. Unfortunately for COVID, there are vulnerabilities around age and and certain um, uh, sort of medical medical backgrounds. But we're screening for those. Now, you know specifically, have have you got any of these before you come and see us? And so, I think as a as a standalone sports therapist fundamentally you are a healthy therapist seeing healthy clients who because of your screening the risk that they have been exposed uh, or are a asymptomatic carrier of covid is really really low um, and then you're all wearing ppe just in case but i think mike's point about the fact that actually in a multidisciplinary clinic by definition you that's where you know the physios the osteos are going to be seeing more vulnerable people then the sports therapists and the personal trainers actually have to bear in mind that there will be some crossover within the clinic. So I think that's that's actually really, really key. To be, um, I've just got some guidance here. So uh, for full PPE, um, a medium risk is uh, this includes patients, individuals who have no symptoms of COVID, but do not have a test result. And those people are considered medium risk. So you should wear full PPE. I saw it. I remember so, you that, putting that, that up, Mike. That's yeah. everyone. That's yeah, everyone. yeah, yeah. 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 The, the, the test result, it's even limited to, what, 72 hours, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So, 
to everyone's medium risk. Yeah, really, according to that. Yeah, and I think you know, I'll use the word duty of you know the phrase duty of care, which Sharon's just mentioned there. <laughs> We have a duty of care to ourselves to mitigate the risks. We have a duty of care to our clients to mitigate the risks, both the ones who are in clinic now and the ones who are coming in after we've disinfected the whole world and waited for 30 minutes. Um, it's it's, our, it's an obligation we have as a, as a therapist. If we want to do no further harm to anybody, we have to mitigate those risks. Mm-hmm. Um, can I just mention timings? That's a, a question that comes up daily on, on, on the groups. Uh, and I'm trying to give some explanation as to why the 45 minute um you know sort of in clinic treatment came about normally people work for an hour in clinic and and what was uh, collaborated on was that if we have to do the pre-covid screening either by telephone or for or, or video um then that usually takes 15 minutes we, what we then thought so that the therapist is not disadvantaged and to minimize the risk, to mitigate that risk, if we keep the uh, treatment time to 45 minutes, then you're not being disadvantaged. You're already having to pay for PPE. You know, we don't want you to be working for an hour and a half for your normal rate because you're already doing 30 minutes of, of cleaning and documentation for policies and procedures thereafter anyway. Mm-hmm. So that's the reason that the 45 minute came about. It, you won't find it in any government guidance. That was just our sort of belt and braces approach to looking after you our members and and that was a collaboration across all of the associations involved at the gcmt so 45 minutes is the is the recommendation um in clinic you know in in my son's clinic we have a a separate waiting room where you know the sort of temperature checking is taking and they can you know put their clothes in a sealed box and all of those things that we have to do and they can uh, you know write their own temperature on the form and then they you, you go into the treatment room and that but that is then starts the, the time of 45 minutes so it's a couple of minutes in the waiting room uh, just to sort of finalize the um, the signatures if you like and the temperature checks and make sure there's been no changes since we did the the, the pre-covid uh, consultation yesterday or last evening and then it goes in and then and I've said to Jake you know 45 minutes and that's it mm-hmm. can, can I just say uh, and pick up on something uh, Dan said um, earlier said um, what what uh, would that be because I've had training in putting the PPE on as a as a regulated professional um, I've had no training whatsoever in that. Um, I've had to seek my own training. So I've uh, just followed the WHO um, uh, online learning, uh, donning and doffing PPE. That's the that's the extent of the training that I've had. Um, I, I, I know that it would be different if I was in a hospital, um, but in private practice, there, there's been no stipulated requirement for training. Uh, I think it's probably just another example of a line has been drawn, rightly or wrongly, but a line has been drawn between registered health professionals and uh, who have a degree and, and, and those who qualify via diploma or degree but aren't registered health professionals. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter where that, that line was going to be drawn. Some people would be, uh, you know, disgruntled with that line. It's oh, yeah. any line, isn't it? So um, just follow, follow the professional associations. Uh, recommendations. <laughs> it's going to be a T-shirt, isn't it? It's going to be your new logo. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> what the... yeah just uh, Dan. Yeah, we appreciate you were replying to Adam, but Mike, we just picked oh, up sorry, Dan. as well as, a, as another health professional. Adam worked in the NHS and he had responded that he'd had the appropriate training and donning and doffing. Right. But when he was yeah. contacted by track, track and trace, they just asked him what PPE he was wearing. They didn't ask him to, you know, quantify his procedures. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Can we talk gloves? Oh, yes. gloves are off. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take the gloves off and talk gloves. Um, is because I put out a few posts um, about whether gloves were a requirement or not, and we then talked about whether gloves actually help or not, which is probably besides the point. If it's if it's a requirement from your professional association, then it sounds like you need to have it for insurance. But is it where are we with gloves for STA, Gary? Should... Uh, gloves should be worn. Okay. Yeah, until until we issue guidance on in the file section of our member site, then it's gloves, aprons, visors, and masks. Aprons as well. Yeah. See, I didn't know that. Yeah, and it's not wipeable aprons; it's disposable aprons. Okay. Yeah. So you saying categorically here on Let's Talk About Tuesday evening that if you're not wearing gloves, an apron, 
we take the mask and the visor as as given, then potentially you might not be insured. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to make a getaway there. Uh, yes, that 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 is my understanding. Yeah, you, we, our advice is to for full PPE, as Mike indicated before. If you're wearing belt and if you're doing the belt and braces approach, it might be easier for the professional association to fight your corner if you are contacted by track and trace and asked to isolate. Right, I want the comments to go crazy now because well, my impression so, from Facebook was fifty. I don't know, probably about sixty forty in favour of not wearing gloves, and it was kind of backed up with logical reasons, which even I succumbed to eventually. I started off a couple of weeks ago thinking gloves, 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 and when I actually got back to teaching and talking to the students and working out actually why are we doing this, am I better off, or can I just wash forearms and hands? And there were some people on Facebook saying I'm wearing gloves, but I don't bother with the forearms, which I didn't quite understand personally. I don't get that, but. Before we get into the maybe the conversation about do gloves make a difference, if you're STA and talking about the other organisations, you should be wearing gloves can to I, be insured. Can I, just, can I just clarify what the insurance? You know, my view, and I and I'm naturally a cynic and devil's mm. advocate. I, I think that you know, if you ring up Balens, with respect, you are going to get through to a salesperson. You are not going to get through to a policymaker. Um, you're not going to get through to the manager of the STA affinity scheme. Um, so some of the guidance that's given by some of the salespeople at Valence, they, they'll say, yes, you are covered. OK, in the worst case scenario, um, if you were to go to court, I think there's a there's a there's a likelihood that if you weren't be able to demonstrate that you were wearing the PPE as directed by the STA or your professional association, that the insurance company say, well, actually, we, we'll, we won't represent you. And then you could be talking of 150 grand legal bill. So my advice is that wear the PPE, as we advise, let us deal with the insurance company and iron those things out. And we will make changes as and when the underwriters give us the clear, concise information. Mm. Okay, people. Well, I'm expecting a few comments going there. Because, well, I mean, I know personally gonna, that gloves, I, I can see the them. argument against gloves. I'll put the cat among the pigeons just between the four of us and put the ISRM hat back on and say, we don't do gloves or aprons. <laughs> so in other words, you're saying you should yeah. follow the guidelines of your professional association. Uh, essentially. Yeah. yeah. But... <laughs> so, um, yeah. So it, how did that happen then? How come we've got two professional associations? Well, I, I mean, I think that, you know, both ISRM and ourselves are independent of, of any sort of, if you like, council. So there's the GCMT, which is the, the lead council for soft tissue therapies. And that's a, a, a collaboration of a number of associations. Um, you know, and we, we've been invited to join. We've both been invited to join um, and we're both hanging back. Um, I, I have some concerns, uh, not least the fact that certain associations within the GCMT sought to elevate their sort of members' importance by classifying them as medical professionals and then had to retract that statement. And I think that did untold damage to the industry. Um, you know, we are, you know, like Matt, you know, we are, you know, directly in, in, in contact with, with Public Health England and, and, you know, other authorities. And we will be revisiting our, um, our policies and procedures as soon as we get the clarification. It may well be that we, you know, and, and don't quote me on this at the moment, but it may well be that we relax certain things uh, once we've got the clarification. But at the moment, it's, it's belt and braces, mm -hmm. you know, uh, aprons, gloves, visors and masks. So, so from a from an ISRM perspective, um, as, as soon as lockdown kicked off, or or rather late, later into lockdown, when it became clear at some point we would be opening, um, we engaged two um, health and safety consultants. Uh, one of whom happens to be a soft tissue therapist, which um, was really useful because, of course, you know we mentioned earlier offline that sort of Public Health England don't necessarily understand you know all of the ins and outs of what it means to be a sports therapist a sports massage therapist and and so actually having someone who uh wears two hats whatever those hats are is, is useful sometimes and so you know we've we've got um a soft tissue therapist who who is a health and safety consultant um and then we also um recruited a uh, an outside uh, separate third party health and safety consultant as well and started putting together our risk assessments based on what a soft tissue therapist does who is ISRM 
covered, which generally means they've done an ISRM diploma. So we know exactly what they are doing in clinic and so can, um, can essentially could personalize, if you will, the, the guidance we were giving from the health and safety perspective. And as we say that when, when we do this, you know, a risk assessment by definition is trying to reduce the level of risk as much as feasibly possible um, within sensible limits. Because, you know, uh, as, I, as I said earlier, as a soft tissue therapist, you are seeing a health, because we're doing the screening, the pre-screening, you are seeing a healthy client, you are a healthy therapist, the risk is already minimal by the time they come into clinic. Um, and in fact, the guidance that we pulled together, or our health and safety consultants pulled together, was so close to what the close contact guidance from the government was when it was released, then we only had to make a few changes. And, and the, the biggest one there, frankly, was the visor. We, we didn't include a visor in our internal documentation um, and obviously updated that uh, as the government came out. In terms of the gloves, it's always been on the government website that gloves are required unless skin to skin contact is necessary for the treatment. And it was the opinion of the ISRM that skin to skin contact was a fundamental part of the treatment. Um, and therefore with all of the other elements of our risk assessment taken into account, we felt that, that gloves were not necessary because skin to skin contact was, was part of the, the, the treatment that we were providing. I've got to jump in there because I'm really interested just to Perfect. kind of confront you. What do you think? <laughs> what, what, why do you think um, skin to skin is an essential part of massage? See, I knew you were going to ask me that. I'm pleased um, that you know me so I well. Got an answer. <laughs> I really should have prepped an answer for this, shouldn't You've I? Had time. I kept my mouth shut. Um, so es essentially, um, I think it boils down to what you think think or me personally I'm going to talk personally here I think it boils down to what you think massage is and is doing um and therefore what that that element of touch is doing as part of the treatment if someone's coming to you and you believe you are able to release adhesions and stuff simply by applying pressure then yeah you can use a gloved hand you can use a tool you can use whatever you want if it's to do with um i suppose more subtle contact it is harder to do that as a therapist through gloves you by definition lose an element of of of, uh, of tactility i think also if as a massage therapist you are going to use forearms and elbows then gloves doesn't make sense the the third bit i suppose on all of that is if you are doing a, if you're sticking consistently to your hand washing routine, what are gloves doing that your hand washing isn't covering? Matt, you crawled out of a corner. I pushed you in there rather roughly pretty well. <laughs> Phew. I like it. I thought you were going to start saying that you can't improve blood flow circulation with gloves on or you can't break down. Honestly, I tried and the no, it's there, cool. so to that <laughs> that's been totally <laughs> no, I think the important thing you said, and I just want to verify again that it's regardless of whether you think gloves are doing any good or not, then you have to follow your professional association guidelines to check. <laughs> it's important. But it's interesting to talk about anyway. Um but yeah, that was the point that got me when I was looking at various conversations going on. Obviously, if you've got um, a cut, an open cut or something on your hands and you're continuously using the hands on top, then, then yeah, that increases the chance of transmission of some form. But if your hands aren't, haven't got any cuts on them, then uh, the gloves aren't really doing anything. Um, yeah, are they? I'm not too worried yeah. about the tactile, the difference, although it's important for the client. It's like it's more important to me that I'm reducing the chance of looking after myself and the client. For me, that's more important than if it's... Mm -hmm less tactile and that sort of thing but if the gloves aren't doing anything then and it and maybe they're making it even more awkward because somebody in the comments said i'm washing my hands and then putting gloves on and is it too much no because you still have to wash your hands every time you grab the gloves and take them off and wash them again so it's not like you're saving yourself any washing yeah, yeah there is an argument yeah. about gloves causing cross-contamination i can't i can't see that because 
like you say, you're washing your hands before you put your gloves on. You, you're washing your hands after you've taken them off and put them in the appropriate uh, sealed container. Um, so why are we getting cross-contamination? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of jump in that and say, so why gloves? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but someone can say, why I'd, not? Because yeah, it feels oh, yeah, nice, it doesn't yeah, cut it for the, me. I think the problem is, no, no one knows. Yeah. Right. We have no idea. We're, we, we've had no studies done on this. Um, we, we have no idea what best practice is. So and that and that's the issue, um, and we won't know for months until until the studies are done, and then when the studies are done, we'll have new guidance. Yeah. And I now I think in the meantime we just do what we can that we think will mitigate risk the best, and I I, I think that's that's it because we we can go around in circles all night about it. <laughs> and it you know, we literally have no idea. We don't know. Hopefully, in time for uh, next year's pandemic, we should be better prepared. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we might all agree, even. I mean, hell, yeah. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> so I'm just checking Gina's uh, Gina, sorry, Gina, Gina. Gina's comment here. Um, yeah, Gina says gloves can cause a risk of cross infection, and you could happily argue. So yeah, what is it? Is it because if you've got gloves on, then you get a bit slack, and you're not, you don't think you have to wash your hands, maybe? Whereas really, you have to just as much, and you have got to make sure you take them off properly. Like, and so here's here's the thing with that. So if you thought that and you had that in your risk assessment, so you wash your hands, you put your gloves on, and then you wash your gloves, and then you take them off and wash your hands again. Mm. So that you stick to the guidelines and you, you eliminate that. the risk of cross contamination. So it's yeah, it's if you did think think that and that was part of your process, then you you can mitigate that in your risk assessment. So, mm. so I suppose just a should we be wearing elbow length gloves oh nice line matt thank you oh There's an image i mean <laughs> i would look fabulous if you want to matt if you want to <laughs> but but you know, let's, let's be realistic here a massage therapist who's purely using their hands or a sports therapist doing massage who's purely using their hands is in for a fairly short career so it will be happening you will be using forearms and elbows if there is a cross-contamination yeah. issue if there is a contamination risk with ungloved hands, then surely there is a contamination, the same contamination issue with unprotected skin on skin anywhere. Um, and yeah. just to be clear, I only use my forearms and elbows. There is no more skin on skin. Um, oh yeah, yeah. gonna have a short-term career massage then. <laughs> That's how your pilot survives. No, but it's true. There's no, po I don't see there's point in using gloves and then using naked forearms unless well you can do but it kind of takes away the although you could argue that it's more likely to have cuts and things and abrasions on your hands than on your forearms but i there was therapists who i respect online who were saying they're using gloves and they're not using forearms um they're just mm -hmm. getting by without it because they can okay it might not be as the variety of technique they want to do but essentially they can get the job done they can relax down the nervous system in a variety of ways without having to use the forearm. Or I think, I think wasn't it you, Mike? You were using tools, were you, instead? If you did yeah, want to get yeah, deeper. So and... I'd, yeah, I just use um, instrument-assisted massage uh, rather than elbows, yeah. Mm. yeah. Seems such a personal um, think, choice, doesn't it? I think I think the thing is, as well, it's um, we're, we've got to think about the patient or the client because um, your client has a massive part to play in all of this. Oh, can you, ah, can you see my daughter trying to uh, creep in? Yeah. <laughs> that was a Dalmatian. Subtle yeah. and a brick. Yeah, Supple that leopard. That wasn't very subtle at all, was it? You may as well stand up, Flo. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Claire. Hey, everyone. Say hello to the Sports Therapy Association. Uh, yeah, so you, you've got to um, consider what, what they want. And um, if and what I've found with my, um, with my practice is uh, they have felt really comfortable because we have gone whole hog and they feel comfortable to come back and i know some patients won't like it and they won't like you wearing gloves and and that's a personal a personal choice but um i, I think that it's actually been a selling point for us we, we've been uh, we've been pushing it and to, to say you know you can if you go to your gym you go to the local leisure center and they'll have none of this in place but we've got we've got all of this in place so if you feel vulnerable then you can come here and 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 hopefully we've um, made you feel as comfortable as possible. Uh, yeah, I wonder if those people who don't want to wear gloves would be happy for their surgeon next time they're in the theatre uh, after he's gone through his scrubbing not to wear any gloves. I, th I think that's... Gary's in I there. Think that's oh, a here we point. go. It's nice well, to be a two-hour episode, everybody's I mean, warming up now. 
if we look at it from a uh, from a risk perspective, okay, so <clears throat> you could end up with cuts and abrasions on your hands, but as a as a clinician, if we want to call ourselves that, they should be covered anyway. Yeah. So the 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 addition of a glove is belt and braces, but if you've got any open wound on your hand, then you should not be touching people with that open wound. Mm -hmm. it, assuming that your hands are in good condition, then um, you are not touching the client's open wounds. Again, it's a contraindication. You would be avoiding that area. We know that COVID is not transmitted through sweat. It is only transmitted um, through um, uh, particles that have come from the respiratory system. So unless you've made a terrible mistake with your dry needling and there's blood everywhere, um, I, I don't see that the surgeon analogy <laughs> really fits in because by definition with a surgeon there's probably blood everywhere um and and so there is that that you know the skin barrier has been broken and, and covid does not go through the skin covid goes through the the um the membranes in in our respiratory system um sorry i felt i had to <laughs> yeah I, I suppose i was being a bit flippant really but i know and i sort of went for it <laughs> the point is that on the hands, you know, we've got we've got fingernails, we've got lots of creases and crevices, more so than on the forearm. Yeah. So, you know, is it a greater risk? You know, do we clean our hands properly? Does the do the gloves mitigate that? Well, I uh, I mean, I, I guess another possibly rhetorical question, but this is surely the forum for that. If if gloves were so imp if if hand washing wasn't good enough then why isn't the government encouraging the general public to use gloves when they are on public transport, when they are in areas like supermarkets, where there is an, a lot of repetitive tactile, yes, it's not skin on skin, well, probably not skin on skin on public transport, <clears throat> but quite frequently you'll be touching a surface immediately after someone else. Now, if hand washing, which is and has been the government's number one kind of priority from the start isn't good enough why are we not all being told to wear gloves mate matt i don't think you can use the government's government. recommendations <laughs> to strengthen any argument i'm not just saying that for comedy effect but if you want to know what the government's going to say just look at the rest of the world and we'll be doing that in two weeks it's like okay but are there any are i get there, your idea but don't use yeah the is there anywhere in the world that's that's mandating gloves for their populations i'm i'm, I'm asking i don't know I think if anybody came in wearing gloves to my clinic, I'd tell them to take them off and wash their hands and come in. Um, <laughs> because God knows God knows where they've been. Especially <laughs> if they went to the elbow. <laughs> yeah, but would you, would you, in that sense then, just to take that stage further, if they came in without gloves, would you tell them to wash their hands? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, the, the thing is, it's... Um, uh it, like matt said if you've been around you know touching um things in a supermarket yes there is a cross infection risk and um so you hand sanitize or you wash your hands as many times as you can throughout the day and that's why there are um sanitary stations at, at the entrance and exit of, of everywhere in public public life now um and it will be the same in the clinic as well you know you come in from from i mean the first thing we do is that we don't let anybody touch the door. We open the door for them. They come in, temperature check, and hand sanitise. Boom, straight away. And that, and that's their that's their uh, welcome to the <laughs> clinic at the moment. On uh, just uh, an interesting point about temperature checks. You know, some of the feedback I'm getting from some of the, the STA members who are using the uh, the forehead thermometers say that they feel uncomfortable. So it feels like they're pointing a gun at somebody's head. Yeah, yeah. In. I think you have to. I think you have to warn people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <'Cause>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but again, what we've done with that, we've done a video of what to expect when you come in. And yeah. um, so uh, and we send that to everybody um, so they know exactly what's what's coming up. Um, but, yeah, it's, it, it is. Uh, we kind of hold it gangster style on the side. <laughs> yeah. Doing uh, when we're doing our temperature checks. But, um, yeah, it's or, or you can get them to uh, them to do their own as well. It's um, um, and then you just re you just read the reading. Um, but the thing is, as well. How valid are those tests? I have no idea. I, I don't think they're very good at all. Um, you know, you do if you did three tests in a row, there's going to be a difference of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees. So um, how reliable, how valid are those um, yeah, infrared temperature sensors? Again, we don't know. We are, we're, the, it's just not been done. Well, I, I I don't test at my own clinic, but I um, it's the protocol at the one of the physio the physio clinic I work at, um, and so 
forehead temperature check, shoot them with the with the thermometer, and and yeah, I'm always like, can I shoot you in the forehead, please? Um, you know, I, I've had clients who register at like 33 degrees. I'm like, I'm concerned for your health, but for other reasons. Yeah, yeah. And, and they'll come in, yeah. and go, oh, sorry, I'm a bit, I'm a bit sweaty. I've just arrived. I just j jogged through the car park. I'm like, you're registering at 33. I'm not sure I trust the gun anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the tolerance is half a degree, isn't it, on some of them? So, yeah. It's a tricky one. I just want to draw attention to Faye, who seems to be Faye Small, who's producing some really good stuff. I hope she does put all the links she's uh, talking about. Uh, let's put a few of them up. Uh, doesn't the research suggest that gloves actually hold on to COVID-19 more than skin? She either reads around or she's a conspiracy theorist. It's one of the two, but I'd love to see some um, information on that, Faye, and thanks for sharing. If you can find some links to that, because then later on you're talking about, yeah, the cross-contamination is from the surface of the gloves. So that'd be good to have some more information about that. You said there are some studies um, about COVID and different surfaces. Um, you're gonna you're gonna be busy tonight, aren't you, once we finish uh, up, Faye? Uh, open <laughs> surface stuff came out quite early on because they were comparing like metal to plastic to wooden. Yeah. Stuff. But to Mike's point earlier, I'm I'm not aware of studies on gloves. The only studies I've seen have been mostly focused on visors, and that was just because something came out of Switzerland where I think it was um of, of, a, of a bunch of people that became infected when they looked at the environment that people were in people wearing the face masks were not infected but people wearing only visors were infected um and i think that that led on to recommendations of if you're going to wear a visor wear a mask as well um mm -hmm. but not necessarily if you're going to wear a mask you have to wear a visor it was a it's only a small study but it was quite an interesting one yeah well stick that any links which obviously us and um people can put in there as I always say this comments can be the place to go to and add stuff to if you're interested about ppe so we'll keep it alive and going we are approaching um 8 59 i'm just having a quick look down through there are some cracking the comments there's there some are, great yeah, stuff in there guys you're really on fire now we've got like 54 55 people actively contributing so i do thank you guys for coming along adam tonks is giving some great perspective from working in the nhs which is well worth having a look and read through um so yeah speakers though thank you for joining us um anything else particularly you think we should be talking about mike or matt with regards to ppe any other subjects we haven't brought up i suppose the um Go on, Mike. Sorry, go on, Matt. No, I'll go second. I was going to say about the aprons. I think Gary mentioned it earlier because I, I was looking. Um, I had a look at the guidelines again today, just um, just to uh, get ready for this tonight. And because um, I I was really I really hate all the waste um, that you know chucking all this stuff into landfill. And um, the uh, but you, we still we have to wear disposable aprons. That that's the guidelines. We can't wear ones that you that you clean down um so um yeah i don't know whether we um explicitly have said that but um yeah that that's the that's the case which is unfortunate and i suppose just to build on the waste side of things from from my perspective the 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 change to requiring type 2 masks is quite frustrating um because by definition they're disposable um there was some some rumblings that that i'd heard and i have absolutely no um kind of solid comments on this but the rumblings i'd heard that actually two layer was what was meant not type two um and so maybe at some point particularly for the close contact services i hope we can go back to a a decent um you know maybe a decent specification but fundamentally a reusable washable face mask um interesting which, which would be great but as it stands at the moment the fact that it says type 2 on the government website is really frustrating to me from a waste perspective definitely just throwing this question out there um just coming to my head but because i'm dealing with a lot of students and these days so many students have got anxiety problems or history problems i do see quite a lot of students from disadvantaged backgrounds where they've had bad experiences and they can't wear masks for that sort of reason but I don't know if there's anybody in the house or what is the guidelines for a therapist who, well, let's say for asthma or something or for spirity problems, can't wear a mask. Does that mean that their medical exemption thing means they can still practice? Or does it mean that they haven't actually got a job? Well, doctors have been told not to give medical exemptions um, to anybody. Um, so uh, what I'm advising members, if they are asthmatic or they have panic attacks or whatever, then they should discuss this with their client on an on a individual basis and they should document it 
Um, so, you know, I, I will see you tomorrow. I, I'm not wearing a mask for the following reasons. Would you wear a mask? Are we happy to continue? And as long as you're, you're sort of covering yourself, and I know disclaimers will never stand up in a court of law, but if, as long as you're doing everything you can to explain the reasons for it, then, then it's acceptable. Um, if it means that the difference between working and not working. What about in terms of insurance? Uh, again, that would be you would have to take that up individually with the insurance mm -hmm. company because you are going against really what what the guidance is. Um, but so anybody who's asked me, I'll say, please get clarification from your insurance company. Tell them that this is what I've said. Make sure that they agree with it. And then we've, we've got a way forward. I guess with all the use of the word guidelines and recommendations and guidelines, if you're you and the client are quite happy just not wearing any form of protection at all, then you're not really breaking any rules, are you? As long as the client's happy, you're happy, and you've had a word with insurance, because there are any recommendations, aren't they? Or well, there are any yeah. recommendations, yeah. And as I, I in, in, go on, Mike. Sorry, I was going to say I think that's one of the reasons why we're allowed to stay open, um, because uh, we're, we're COVID secure. Um, because if we didn't have those things in place, then we would no longer be COVID secure. And um, yeah, yeah, that we, uh, um, I think we would quite swiftly be closed, closed up. And if the EHO got wind of it, then they they shut you down. Mm. Yeah. Did you see in the comments, Gina had put a, a, an interesting uh, comment in there that been a study on the thermometers <laughs> in comparison to rectal thermometers. Now I. I just couldn't picture taking that to the ethics committee myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or yeah, doing the study. <laughs> yeah, well, what, what I worry about with those is um, uh, is that all the different types you can get. Um, because you can get very, very good pieces of kit and then you can get stuff that's cheap, cheap knockoff thermometer. So um, it's uh, if the thermometers that were used in that study are used in the clinic, great. Um, but that are, are all the other manufacturers manufactured to the same standards I, again i i don't know and and um i think it's so i think a lot a lot of the things we do um yes they mitigate risk but i think they're all part of the theater of our uh, subjective history and objective exam yeah. um and they make the patient feel comfortable uh, and I think that that's an important aspect of, of all of this as well. You know, we, we need to make sure that people are, are comfortable coming back in to see us again. And if, uh, if, if we have to go through those steps to do that, then I think it's steps worth taking. Uh, there's, there's an update from Gina that it was a specifically named thermometer and they now have them in the clinic. I'm not sure whether that's the oh, red or the rectal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah if, uh, let, let us know which ones they are, Gina. That would be great. Right. Um, it is now, I'm just thinking how, I mean, it would actually be quite simple with a, with a client kind of in prone position on the couch. Rectal with the model would be quite easy, wasn't it? As long as you inform them what you're going to do. It's quite simple to, but it anyway, let's not go me, down there. It reminds me of the Physio Matters podcast extra bit I was listening to about Cordra. So one thing, Matt, is this the Physio Matters podcast or Massage Matters? Because I'm getting confused now. The logo is really similar. Massage Matters. Oh, I'm, I'm glad <laughs> um, you brought that up. <laughs> well, I was going to bring it up anyway, do a, a, a bit of a plug for you anyway. Is there a new podcast? Is there? I, I saw you, something, yeah, yeah it's like massage matters. Really blitzing social media, Mike. Good grief. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Matt. Say what you're going to say and then give us a plug for, for massage matters. Go on. Uh, oh, no, I was, I was, I was going to say there was um, a uh, conversation about cord requiner syndrome and, and obviously um, loss of sensation in saddle region uh, is, is, is one of the bits. And there was this sort of conversation about. How appropriate is it in obviously physios, not massage therapists, but how is appropriate is it for physios to um, to either check or ask the client to check in, a, in an environment? So it was way funnier before <laughs> that bit, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on. <laughs> I, t I tell you what would be really, really good um, if you, the government guidelines that comes out and it says, right, okay, you have to wear a disposable apron. If they had another column next to it saying why. That, that would yeah. be really, really good. And for everything. OK, so you've got to wear this type of mask and this is why. And that's the thing that causes all these debates because we don't know the reasoning. And it's so frustrating that we don't know that reasoning. So if you could find out the why, anybody, <laughs> that would be great. I mean, we, we could, we, we could yeah. expand that and take it to government policy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Brexit. <laughs> everything. Yeah, why? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Good grief. You don't expect them to tell us why for that, do you? It's because <laughs> my mate paid me. Um, that's got very political. Six, now, I'd, li I'd like to understand like the, the, the rule of six as well. You know, there was uh, one of the stage yeah. signs that said it's an arbitrary figure. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, uh... Unless you're hunting, then it's kind of cool. It's okay. <laughs> See now you've got it. <laughs> I know. Let's not let's not go down that road. We can anyway. Right. Um, yeah, Matt, go on. To, tell us a little bit about um, massage matters. Go on. Um, thank you. So so um, launches well. So we're premiering it. Premiering it on YouTube on our YouTube channel Saturday night about seven thirty, I think it is, uh, and then it will be live on uh, all your normal podcast platforms as of uh, Sunday morning. Um, and yeah, so. The Physio Matters podcast, I think the best way to explain it is they've gone from being a program to a channel, uh, and then there's going to be new programs joining that channel. And um, and we, <laughs> we're the first out the gate, <laughs> I think is probably the, the best way of putting it. Um, and so it's myself, uh, Anna Maria, and Becky Demont Horton. Um, and we've, we've formed a, something we call the Massage Collective, which the idea was anyway to try and fill a little bit of that gap between um, almost some of the stuff that's still taught in, in, in massage and then the, yeah, but here's the evidence groups um, because there is a bit of a gulf. And I think for, well, from experience and, and certainly others I've, I've spoken to, leaping that gulf can be uh, soul destroying um, and uh, not just a little bit disconcerting. And so we wanted to try and provide something that fit in the middle, which is not wrong, but is perhaps a little bit more compassionate and gentle in the messaging. Very uh, good. Very Mass good. Matters podcast is um, our ability really to, to talk about that um, in, uh, in, in just a, a really cool, uh, accessible way. And, and obviously, with the relationship with physio matters podcast um to people more than just massage therapists but obviously we're we're hoping it will be mostly picked up by massage therapists or sports therapists who are intrigued by this sort of evidence-based practice and want to understand a bit more about it but are perhaps not yet prepared to sit down and read the papers and think oh my god i don't know what this says very good i can't think of three people who i prefer to listen to regarding on talking about that so well done Okay. We'll see if you're really looking forward to it. It can be great. Um, Mike, have you got anything coming up? Um, I've been I've been trying to work out a date for the uh, cadaver workshops yes. um, after the anatomy thing the other day, uh, the other week. Um, but the uh, universities aren't letting us in at the moment. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be April time. Um, yeah, so that that was that. And then we've got our um, new we're starting face to face again on the movement therapy diploma. So we're starting again in November. Uh, so that's really, really good. Really exciting to be back uh, teaching people in full PPE. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever full means. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, we had good feedback about it. It was, it was an absolutely wonderful um, hour with you talking about that. So people can still go to your website and click on the interested link, can they? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Just register your interest and then uh, we'll get in touch uh, as soon as we've got a date. Yeah, I, d I don't think it's going to be in London. I think it's going to be at Keele University. I think that's where we might be able to get in because KCL, um, they're, uh, they're really strict at the moment with any external visitors. So uh, I think uh, Keel might be the best option. Okay, fantastic. Right, um, Gary. Anything else you need to say? Yeah, just a, just a couple of things that are picking up from the comments. Uh, Tracy McClimmons asked, uh, "They've got a partially sighted student, cannot see once a visor has been on for a few minutes. What would the guidance be for her?" And again, it's it's like we said before. It's 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 discussing it with you know the, the rest of the people in the group, explaining the reasons why um and everybody being in agreement that that person doesn't have to wear the visor um and and, and as an educator you documenting that um so that uh, that you're covered as well uh and then just one further down faye has said uh, there should be a podcast called sports therapy matters so <laughs> Faye's volunteering for lots tonight so <laughs> <Faye>. <laughs> you could definitely provide the evidence that'd be great and so hopefully i'm looking forward to those links faye thank you for everything you've contributed in that yeah Brilliant. It's been right. a really, really good discussion, hasn't it? It's, it's, I think it's because it is quite, um, you know, an emotive subject. There's been lots and lots of comments, and I haven't been able to keep up with them as this, as I'm, you know, scrolling through. So my next hour will be to read back and, and <laughs> answer the ones that I can. But yeah, it's um, you know, there's been a lot of good discussion tonight, and, and plenty of people, you know, in the house. That's great, which is what it's all about. 
And I, right. I always, I always love. I can't remember who it was earlier who mentioned it. I think it might have been Becky Carroll, uh, who said that uh, the conversation was a bit like a game of tennis. Um, I yeah. always enjoy that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tricky, isn't it, with a subject like this? But I'm hoping. I mean, one of the things which I was thinking when we all do get together and do this is that it makes it kind of clear to therapists out there who are stressing is that that it isn't black and white, and you do have to listen to the association you're with, and hopefully. It, it helps hearing Gary say that, you know, follow these guidelines or you might have trouble with insurance for now. But, mm -hmm. you know, the good thing about the STA and I'm sure any other associations which we should be represented tonight is that it's a constantly evolving, keeping in touch with the kind of um, policies and evidence and things. So, but for the moment, I think the biggest message seems to be listen to your professional association because if you do um, have to, if you do have problems, then, then they'll be able to back you up if you're following their guidelines. Um, Great. Okay. Well, look, Matt, Mike, thank you so much for jumping in last minute. Thanks for having um, us. There was a lot of. I know Anna was busy, for example, Matt. Um, but thanks for coming along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did, and I Becky, and Becky was busy I'm as well. So yeah. thanks for jumping in. <laughs> <laughs> Especially as we interrupted your Christmas in the Neverland. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Why do I pick on that? It's stupid. Oh, it is. Um, and Mike, thanks so much for stepping up as well. That's great. It's such no um, short notice. Um, You're welcome. So um, I'm going to put you down to the lobby whilst I just say uh, goodbye to people in the room. And then once we've gone, um, what's the opposite of live? Not dead. That's terrible. Once we're not live anymore, <laughs> then uh, we can have a little chat after as well. Um, and the same with you, Gary. Thanks so much for stepping up and, and helping everything, obviously, you do. Um, so yeah, I'm going to get rid of you guys just quickly and then, um, but don't go away unless you've really got to disappear. But yeah, thanks to all three of you for joining us for another Let's Talk About. There's Gary, Matt, and Mike. There we go. And most importantly, um, far more important than them, is thanks to everybody in the room, uh, members and non-members for joining us. It's been really cool tonight. I think that's probably top figures of people getting involved. It's obviously a very hot topic. Um, as always, share it. It will go onto YouTube. Share the link of YouTube. Um, let's get more people, particularly non-STA members. I mean, and STA members. I mean, it's probably, a, I don't know, I, I get the impression that maybe 100, 150 STA members we've seen in here. And I'm sure I've seen them in the thousands. So don't be afraid to share. I know a lot of you are, but just share it. Let other people know um, just so we can spread the good word, especially when we're getting guests, um, you know, like Mike and Matt giving up their free time to come in. So, yeah, do share stuff um just to let you know that this thursday talking of massage matters um as we were um alice san vito uh, will be coming in she's uh if you're not aware of her <clears throat> excuse me she's from st louis missouri um fantastic um big name amongst the uh debates that go online about improving the evidence behind massage classic case of let's do it less wrong we haven't got all the answers but let's just move in the right direction um, Alice is going to be one of the speakers at the Run Chat Live conference in October 2930, but we're going to get a little taster of what she's all about and why she has her hashtag shit that massage therapists say, uh, why that's become so popular on Facebook. Um, really lovely lady, massive history in massage and somebody who's rolled with the evidence um, and moved with the times fantastically and now is a real big spokesperson for somebody who keeps massage alive, very much in love with massage, but let's be less wrong um, than we have been in the past sort of thing. So, yeah, that'll be this Thursday at 8 o'clock um, on my Facebook channel, so facebook.com forward slash Matt Phillips RCL. Um, was there anything I needed to say? That was about it. So, yeah, do join us for that. Right, thanks again for joining us, people. We will be back next week. <clears throat> next week we have Brendan Chaplin. It's going to be all strength and conditioning. Um he is doing us the pleasure of joining us for an hour. Um, I think the working title is it's not all about sets and reps. So any of you who are familiar or not familiar with Brendan, one of the leading names um, in how to uh, become basically an elite coach. That doesn't mean elitist. It means in his own words, just being able to walk into any gym in the world, work with any athlete in the world of any level and give them an elite service. Um, very big. Um, lots of great training. Um, and so he's going to be in to talk about that. So if you feel that you need to brush up on your um, strength and conditioning and the programs you're giving out to people, and it's not just a case of let's do 10 by three, um, then do join us next Tuesday, eight o'clock um, here at the Sports Therapy Association. All right, that's it, gang. Thanks so much. Hopefully see some of you on Thursday, eight o'clock. Until then, take care of each other and, uh, and spread the good word. Bye-bye. <laughs>